one. Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, this is Jim Hodson here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas, uh, here today with Ed Fairchild. Uh, Ed is a retired Air Force pilot, and uh, <clears throat> during the Vietnam War, Ed was a, uh, a red marker. And I know that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of you folks, but uh, <clears throat> so Ed, maybe you'll just uh, explain a little bit about who the red markers were and what your jobs were. Well, the red markers were uh, Air Force pilots, and uh, they were uh, assigned to the Arvin Airborne Division uh, in Vietnam. And uh, that started, uh, as a matter of fact, the first forward air controller in Vietnam was a red marker. Okay. Uh, and uh, the uh, Vietnamese Airborne Division was the top troops in uh, Vietnam. So they were going all over Vietnam and they had American advisors called Red, their call sign was Red Hat. And uh, they also had forward air controllers assigned to that unit. And uh, our call sign was um, red marker and a number like mine. I was red marker six. Okay. okay. And um, they used those same numbers over and over again over the years. So there are probably another four or five people who flew as red marker six. But okay, I did, sure. I did for um, about nine months, and then uh, they had a problem at um, Sector ALO. Uh, position out there that was having some great difficulties and so uh, they picked me up and sent me out there. Okay, what time period was this? Um, actually, I got there in um, October of 1968. Okay. And I left the Red Markers in July of 69. Okay. The latter part of July. Is so were you the first group or were, where were you in the in the the, the order of, uh, of red markers. Were you there at the very beginning? Oh, no. Okay. No, no. They started in around 62, I believe. Oh, that early? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, the red markers were active over there, I believe, from about 62 through uh, 72 or okay, so. Okay, about the 73. time that the war oh, we yes. kind it, of it, okay. It ended, okay. And yes. the whole time, the red markers always flew the bird dogs. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Well, so not true. We actually flew some other things as well later on. Okay. Uh, later, uh, they transitioned uh, to some, uh, O2 for some of the missions. Oh, did you? Okay. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, we've got a model of, uh, of the bird dog here, and it's in uh, red marker colors. And in fact, uh, that number on that airplane is uh, familiar to you, isn't it? Yes, it is. As a matter of fact. Uh, I uh, came to hate that airplane, Liter <laughs> well, literally hate that airplane. Well, tell us that story. And, and uh, you'd be, I, I was out flying, I probably had, I don't know, maybe 300, 350 missions or something at the, at the time this started. And uh, the engines uh, lost all the power, was not running right. And we only flew at about 1,500 feet. And so, and we flew with the windows open and you can see the stuff that's hanging on the wings here. We had a climb pitch prop, and uh, the airplane was pretty dirty, as speaking of uh, aerodynamically speaking. And we flew with the windows open and all that stuff. So at 1,500 feet, you start getting a, a descent about four, four, 500 feet a minute. Okay. And so you got about two, three minutes before you're down in the jungle. And uh, there's nobody down there that was our friend absolutely not a person okay unless we were to have a, a, an active engagement on a one-to-one -one basis or, or a, a firefight or whatever or it was isolated to a general area and so it would just start running bad and i would go down and about uh, oh, 50 or 100 feet above the jungle all of a sudden it would just uh, you just fly right off and uh, that's a little disconcerting. <laughs> oh, I bet. As, as, as you, you see, we flew without a parachute. Uh, there wasn't any way out. You rode it up and you were riding it down. Okay, so uh, it, it would take you down. And then you did that about four or five different times with me. And uh, the really strange part about that was it didn't do it with anybody else. Oh, just you? It just did it with me. And let me tell you, as you... Uh, 
you, you, unless you've been in an outfit like that, you don't really understand because there are a bunch of other pilots and they're doing the same kind of job you are. And um, occasionally somebody starts to lose it a little bit. And so, uh, yeah, they start to become a little bit concerned and they, they become afraid and it, it causes yeah. a big problem. Okay. Let me inter and, interrupt you just a second. Javier, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you're hearing us okay, if you'd give us a thumbs up, please. Uh, I didn't didn't get the sound check to begin with, so it's all right. So please go ahead and continue. Well, uh, and so people started treating me like I was snake bit and had a little, oh, bit, yeah, sure, and sure. Had a little bit of a yellow streak down my back. And, and, and uh, a funny thing about that is I checked, uh, done most of the pilots that were there currently at that time. I'd given the Alder night check out, and I was a tactics IP and, and stuff for the unit. And, but they still, you know, it, it started to get real personal. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. And, uh, and crew chief couldn't find anything wrong with the engine. And, and he really tried. He was a good guy, okay? And he worked hard at it. And uh, he just couldn't figure out what, what was uh, the problem. And there was definitely a problem, okay? So at any rate, uh, Finally, it happened with somebody else. A fellow by the name of Jim Hill was out, and he came back, and he was really upset. And uh, he was just storming mad and, and cursing the airplane and that sort of thing. And, and uh, so somebody asked him, said, well, what happened, Jim? And he says, well, that blank is blank thing quit on me. Said it was just heading towards the jungle. And said, we got down there real close to the jungle a, a few feet or so. And he says, it started running good again, and, and I'm not flying that airplane anymore. <laughs> and so you were vindicated. And, well, yes, and, and they asked him, said, well, how, how did this happen? He says, just like Fairchild said. <laughs> there you go, and right? And I'd already there had you go. four or five instances of this thing, and all of a sudden I, I became okay again. Yeah, there you go. There you Always go. nice to think that the, your fellow pilots think, think yeah. well of you. And uh, so we um, began to work even harder on trying to figure out the problem. And okay. they finally gave up. They couldn't figure out what the problem was. I taxied in one day at another airplane. And, uh, and Sergeant Fisher was sitting, had the cowling off of the engine right here. And he was sitting up here on, on top of that. And, and he was, looked like he was rubbing two things together. And, and I couldn't figure out what he was doing up there. So I went over there and we t I shut the airplane down. We put the pins in the rockets and I got my guns and all that stuff. And, and so I walked over there and I said, I called up to him. I said, well, Sergeant Fisher, what are you doing up there? And he says, well, if I can't fix this thing, he says, I'll tear it up. <laughs> and so what he was doing was he was grinding a nail up in the oil and he would chain the airplane down. Okay. And he would firewall that engine. Just sit there by the Okay. Hour. And then he'd send that oil in, and they said, whoa, wait a minute. There's metal chips in the oil, all right? We're, we're, we're starting to get a, f a few flakes of metal in, in the oil. You better look out. This, this thing's about to have a bearing failure. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure Sean Fisher said, well, that's not real news to me. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, uh, we got a new engine for the airplane. Okay. And after that, it flew very well. Very well, good. Yeah, you know, I, I had a car that was much the same way. Really? A 94 Oldsmobile. Okay. And it wouldn't start on a cold morning. And the local garage, went, they did everything. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with that thing. So I took it down to the Oldsmobile dealer. And I said, I've got a night, my name is Ed Fairchild, I've got a 94 O's. And he said, yes, and it won't start on a cold morning. I said, okay, what yeah, else? Yeah. And he says, as soon as it warms up, it runs fine. And he says, if you pull the coil and you check it, it'll check good, but the coil's bad. Oh, okay, okay. So I said, okay, what do we do about that? He says, you leave your car with me. Uh, I'll replace the coil today. We'll leave it outside tonight and when you come, uh, Tomorrow it'll be cold. We'll go out there and you can start the car right there up. There you go. And it did. Well, we just couldn't figure out yeah. what the problem was with that engine. Well, let's get back to tell us a little bit about your missions as a red marker. Now you were FAC, which is a Ford Air Controller, but uh, tell us a little bit about the missions that you flew. 
Well, when you fly as a forward air controller over there, you're in direct support of the ground troops, okay? At least we, as a red marker, we were because we were dedicated to the Arvin Airborne Division. Now you had a, so you were working with the Arvin, not the U.S. Army? That's correct. Okay. Yes, and, and these were good guys. Uh, those, those were the uh, were top drawer people. Both, okay. Both the officers and the enlisted. Okay. They were good folks, okay? And the uh, American advisors that worked with them were, were good folks as well. And they always made a real point to get to know the fact, okay? Because uh, when they were out there in the jungle and they were wanting some air support, it was, they didn't want to be impersonal. They wanted it to be personal between you and the person that you knew by name. Okay. And, and they didn't introduce you to all their family and their members with pictures. I mean, this was a real personal exchange of information yes. so that, that uh, there was a bond between okay. the American advisor and the American forward air controller. I want to paint a little picture for people here because they're used to the Naval Air Station here and DFW and things like that. Big airfields, concrete, hangars, buildings. But, and even in squadrons, they think of many airplanes and many people. You were operating out of dirt strips and, well, uh, and it's a small, and the, you were a small unit too, weren't you? I'm, yes. Okay. Uh, forward air controllers, we only had about 10 or 11 of us and sometimes you know, because of transfers out and that sort of thing, it would drop down a couple. But generally speaking, we had around 10 people. Okay. And uh, and we lived off base at Tonsonut. We did not live on Okay, base. so you operated out of Tonsonut, which was a big airfield. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, it was international uh, flights and all your heavy transports. Okay. I, I first flew, flew in Vietnam in 1967. Okay. August, uh, August September of 67 in a 141. Okay. And I'd been in and out of there uh, several times before I got over there. And uh, so uh, flying in and out of Tonsonut was not new to me at all. Now, okay. let people know, where, where in the country of Vietnam is Tonsonut? Uh, it's about uh, a fourth of the way up from this very southern tip. Okay. Uh, in, uh, what would be uh, some of the big cities that people might uh, recognize? Well, obviously Saigon. Would okay. Be, it's now called Ho Chi Minh City. Ho, Ho Chi Minh City. Okay. okay, so you were operating there, which was kind of a big metropolitan area, but you operated... Yes, it was. Out, you operated out in the countryside, though. Yes. Okay, now we were based out of, out of Saigon. Okay. But all the operational missions happened out of different other locations where we would go out. Okay. And when we went out there... Uh, you might fly off of a dirt road, you might fly off of a, uh, a dirt strip, uh, um, you might, all right, one, one time about 8 o'clock in the morning I landed on a PSP, which is a pierced steel planking. Yes, Mars, a, Marston Manning. It was a old PSP runway, okay. therefore it had grass growing up through the, through the holes in, in, the, uh, in the planking. And all the uh, abrasive material that you used to stop on it was long gone. <laughs> so about okay. eight o'clock in the morning, I landed that old one on that, and it had uh, dew on the grass. Okay. Boy, well, that I, made it slick, didn't it? Oh, that was like landing on ice. Yeah. In fact, I uh, didn't realize that that was the situation. It's the first time I'd been on that strip. Okay. And uh, so I ended up taking it around came back. I'm sure there were some army pilots over there kind of laughing at yeah, me, but that's yeah, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so you operated a lot with, with the army though? Well, we the all Arvin. operated with the Arvin Air Order Division only. Oh, okay. Occasionally you'd have other people working out of the same place you were working so out of. So describe, describe a, a typical mission that you would have flown. Oh, you would fly out and uh, make contact. Is, let's, let's, for instance, okay, they had a, let's say that the uh, American advisors and the Vietnamese Airborne had a contact with troops. Okay. It's called a TIC or troops right. in contact. And uh, that's primarily when we would go and do uh, stuff like that to do the, the, the mission. Okay. And we would direct artillery or airstrikes with fighters, uh, both Vietnamese fighters and, uh, and U.S. fighters. Okay. okay? Flew a, a lot of uh, work with uh, the Vietnamese. Air Force flying 
A1s. Oh, the, the big, Spads, okay. Which is, yes, which is a big single engine right. uh, airplane. It was, they, and they had a the lot Sky of Raiders, experience. Yeah. Yes, Sky Raider. They had a lot of experience and they were very good. Those guys usually lead would have something like 2,500 hours or 3,000 hours uh, of flying combat missions. Okay. This was not some amateur guy. Yeah. They were good, okay. And, uh, but we'd fly uh, and put in American stuff. I put in some Australian stuff as well. Okay. And, uh, but you, know, you would uh, have the troops in contact and uh, the uh, red hat down there on the ground would offer or would mark it, your target basically where he was, okay, mark his position. And then I would fire a rocket off, off the wing there. Right. Okay, and then also when we ran out of rockets, we had some smoke grenades that are in the back part of okay. the seat. And so you'd reach around behind you and get a smoke grenade. And now you got one in your hand. Okay. It has the pin in it. Yeah. So before you pull the pin in it, you wave it to your left hand and you stick your left hand outside the aircraft. Okay. And when you pull that pin, that, air, that grenade does not come back through that window. Oh, no, you wouldn't want it to, no. <laughs> you, you do not want yeah. to drop that right. inadvertently and have it go off in the cockpit and you just set yourself on fire. Oh, yeah. So you, you stuck your hand outside that left window and that's where it stayed. And so you flew the airplane with your, with your feet. It was a big rudder airplane. Yes. Okay, until... Until you use the rudders in that airplane, you didn't control it right. Okay, and you were um, you were flying all of these with uh, just by yourself, single pilot. You didn't carry an additional crew member with you. No. Okay. No, you were you were in there by yourself, and it flew better with one person than it did two. Okay. Okay. You didn't have the extra weight. Now we flew it sometimes with two people back there, but that was not normally the case. And. Uh, the, uh, so you're operating the radios, you're talking to, what are you using, a, uh, an FM to talk to the ground and well, then using the UHF to talk to uh, whatever your supporting aircraft might we, be? We actually had three radios okay. in the airplane. So we had an FM right. or a Fox mic and we used that to talk to the, <coughs> pardon me, to the ground troops. Right. And uh, uh, the... Uh, VHF right. was used to coordinate input of fighters coming in to provide ordnance to drop on the bad guys. Okay. Okay. And then your control with the with the fighters was on UHF. UHF. So you had one person, two open windows, three radios, and a bunch of noise in the cockpit. So you're busy. It's a busy cockpit. It's a busy cockpit. So you and can't be concerned with flying the airplane too much. Well, the air, the, flying the airplane is almost secondary to what's really going on. Right. What's really going right. on is you're trying to hurt some bad folks, and you're trying not to hurt some good folks. Yeah. Okay. And so you just get to the point to where you got a lot of stuff moving. And in fact, in, you know, one of the most dangerous times to fly as a forward air controller was to fly a night strike. Okay. And the reason why is because now you've got a bunch of airplanes running around out there and it's dark because nobody turns any lights on. Right. Uh, take off at on, on a night nice sortie on the 01, there was not a single light on the airplane. No landing lights, no nav lights, no anti collision lights. You didn't have anything on. Right. And the only lighting you had in the cockpit was a little ultraviolet lamp on each side of the. Of the, of, the, of the cockpit about right there and they shined up on the instrument panel and there were no words with radium on the uh, needle and, right. on the, and on the hash marks on the instruments so you not only had to know which instrument was the cylinder head temperature or which one was whatever okay but you had to know what each one of the markings was and had to memorize it okay because you can uh, you kept it really really dark yeah. total dark yeah uh, inside that cockpit because if you didn't you couldn't see outside well now did you also <clears throat> drop your own flares well or did you use flares at all at night we didn't really use a flare okay okay in the sense of, of using a flare 
we use to mark a target, we use the smoke rockets here on the wing. Okay. 2.75 inch uh, rockets with a white phosphorus warhead. Right. And uh, when they hit, uh, exploded, the warhead was right here in the, in the front of it. Right. And whenever it exploded, uh, you just get a big old puff of white uh, smoke right. uh, from the phosphorus. And that's how you mark the target. And, and then if you were out of rockets, like I said before, you drop smoke grenades right. out the window. Now you got a different color, okay? And, and uh, so that's, you would direct the fighters from there. Right. See, and I flew OV-10s, and at night, we carried our own uh, pair of flares. So we could throw out the flares and then control, uh, control air or whatever we were doing underneath the flares. Oh, so, so you flew OV-10s? Yeah, and I flew OV-10s, yeah. So. Okay, yeah. Uh, so great. let's. So, uh, so you can identify a little bit with what. Oh yeah, but we want the folks that are watching this to identify. How long were most of your missions? Uh, generally speaking, probably three or four hours. Okay. okay. Now it just depends on what all is going on. If you got a troops in contact or something, you're out working that. Um, sometimes you, you couldn't stay that long because you you run out of smoke rockets. You run out of out of grenades smoke grenades in the back of the seat so yeah. then then you uh you had to go get some you had to go rearm okay and uh so uh but mostly you have probably three three four hours okay how many how many times would you fly a day we all died depending on on demand I could, okay probably the busiest day i had up there was the uh the bad guys were coming across the cambodia border and we were uh, operating up near the cambodian border and at night they would hit us with mortars and things like this. And okay. So, yeah, what they would do is they'd come across the Cambodian border and then fire the mortars and stuff that they wanted to fire at us. And then uh, before the sun came up, they would get back across the border so you couldn't get them. Right. So the South Vietnamese the airborne guys got in there and cut them off one night. And a whole big bunch of bad guys got isolated from the, their safe haven over in Cambodia. And uh, so I was the only FAC up there at that particular time. Uh, so I had myself in one airplane, and that was it. Um, I got airborne the first time that morning. It was just very, very shortly after sunrise, actually a little before sunrise. Um, and uh, I probably landed probably three or four times that day um, and uh, rearm. And then what you do is, is while, while they were rearming the airplane and putting the gas in it, uh, you walked around and got something to eat and that okay. sort of thing. Okay, took care of the body, so to speak. But uh, uh, moving around was was uh, extremely important because you would get stove up. They used, there was no rudder trim on the on the uh, rudder. Okay. In flight. Okay. Now, you had a trim tab that you could set. And we did always did okay uh, on the back, but that was permanent. So once you set it, that's where you got it. And if you oh, needed okay. more okay. or less, you you comp uh, uh, compensated by using a, r a rudder pedal. Okay. Pressure. So you were flying with your legs an awful lot, and you could end up getting some cramps and I'll that bet. sort of thing in, in your bet. legs. So as soon as you got on the ground, your objective was to move your legs around. Yeah, so I'll get that. You were headed right back up. And uh, so I flew four, four different sorties that day. I probably was airborne a total of eight, nine hours. That's a lot. Like that. That's a lot of flying. Well, especially when you're so busy. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, so how many missions did you fly? Uh, in total, I flew 566 missions. Okay. In one year. Okay. So you've got about how many hours in the bird dog, would you guess? I have uh, 985 hours, 566 okay. missions. Okay. And uh, you know, I'll tell you what, sometimes in spite of yourself, God takes care of you. Yeah. Even when you don't deserve it. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> and uh, I flew all those missions over there. I never took a single round in the airplane. Wow, that's Not amazing. More. That's Not amazing. One time did they hit me. That's amazing. And uh, I worked real hard at trying to help that not happen. Well, you apparently did a good job. <laughs> I want to mention that uh, we have been asked by the folks up at Air Adventures at Oshkosh this year. They've been following our restoration of the bird dog, and uh, they've uh, asked us to bring our airplane up there for uh, for a display and for special presentations on uh, 
on I think it's Thursday of uh, Oshkosh week. And we're, we're hoping to do that. The airplane is ready. Uh, we're waiting on the FAA for the registration. And if that's the case, Ed is planning to come up to Oshkosh and he's gonna be part of the uh, Part of the group that's going to talk about the red markers and the bird dogs and what uh, what they did to the people up there um, uh, at Oshkosh, and so we're really glad to have him here for this. We've got some things. This model, this beautiful model that we've got, came from a friend of the museum named Gary Willis. Gary has uh, has has helped us a lot on this restoration and and other things regarding the bird dog. And just this week, we got in a few other things from him. So. Uh, maybe I can show people these items and you can describe what they are. Uh, let me, the first thing we've got here is, uh, is this beautiful, here, why don't you hold that in right. because it'll, uh, I've this, actually worn one of those. Yeah, it's a beautiful red beret. Uh, I don't know many of the Air Force, uh, units that, uh, that wore a red beret. What was the red beret all about? I can't really tell you. Okay. I, I know this, all the red hats wore them. Okay. And we did, we as part of our uniform as well. Okay. Okay. And I no longer have mine. Okay. Uh, so I, this was all just part of being part of that red hat group then? Yes. Is oh, that, very, that's very where the, so. that's yes. where that, cause it's okay. So it's just the big family. So then we got a couple of other things here. Uh, if you'd hold that one up and explain what that one is. Well, let's take a look. Here, let's show it to the camera so the camera can see it here. Oh, yeah. It's the, it's airborne, uh, it's the airborne patch. Okay. Is and, that a uh, an RNAV airborne patch? Oh, or is that... all, 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 this is all South Vietnamese. So, okay, that's all, it's South, all Vietnamese. South Vietnamese. Okay. okay. Everything was, was literally South Vietnamese. Okay. Period. Okay. All the people, the whole structure, everything. Okay, and, and it was, uh, so you were kind of like advisors to them, yes, or support yeah. to them. We were actually, actually, if you're really be technical about it, we were the air support for the American advisors. Okay, to the Arvin Airborne Division. That makes all kinds of sense. And then we have this item. If you'd show that to the camera and tell us what that one is, it's, uh, I think I think it's what it's the, a South Vietnamese cross of gallantry. Yeah. Um, and I, I personally don't have that one. Well, I think you're missing it then. You need that for your collection. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, I don't get to keep those unless and, and be proud of them unless I actually earned one. Well, you probably <laughs> earned that one if you didn't have it. So, and that one has a silver star. So I don't know what the, what the significance of the silver star is on that. Do you? No. I mean, I it, it probably has something to do with what they did or how many missions they flew or, or something know. along those, uh, I, those lines. I didn't particularly receive, receive that particular medal, although I've got some okay. others. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, we're going a little bit long here, but before we started, you happened to mention that you didn't start out in the Air Force as a pilot. No, that's true. I actually started out as a navigator. Okay. And I went in as an enlisted man. Okay. Without a college education. And I got my navigator's wings and my second lieutenant bars at the age of 20 years and three months old. Okay. And then I went to nav bomb training to fly as a B-47 or B-52 bombardier, navigator bombardier. Okay. Um, went through that training out at Mather and then came back to Oklahoma and I flew in the B 52s okay. as a navigator and as a radar navigator. And I was over the North Pole in the bottom of a B 52 at 21 and a half years old, and we were loaded with nuclear weapons. Wow. And uh, I was, I've been up there a whole bunch of times. And um, the uh, Later on, uh, before I left uh, to go to pilot training, I actually upgraded to instructor nav, and then from there I upgraded to radar navigator bombardier. And on the B-52, that's probably the most important position, okay. other than the pilot who gets the gas. Okay. Well, when did you decide you wanted to become a pilot? Well, you're sitting around and looking in there, and you start to talk to these people. See, at this point, I go on alert, and I'm, I'm barely 21 years old, and uh, I'm there with people who flew in World War II. Oh, gee, that's right. So I guess so, yeah. I'm, I'm sitting there totally in awe of these guys. They're talking about flying BT-10s. Yeah. And I haven't even seen a BT-10. That's yeah. less flown in one. Yeah. And so for a, a year or so, I bet I didn't say 10 words. But 
I ask questions all the time, and I'd ask a question of my navi radar navigator who was really top drawer. His name was Gary Coleman, and he ended up volunteering for the SR-71. And wow. when he retired uh, in the latter state, in the 90s, out of, out of flying that SR-71, he had more operational missions than any other person in the SR-71. Top, top drawer guy, wow. really good. Wow. And I'd ask him a question, he'd always give me the same answer. And he would tell me, he said, Ed, I want you to go find that, uh, the answer to that. I want you to look it up, I want you to understand it. You come back and explain it to me. Yeah, okay, okay. And so I learned more and quickly than any of the other people there because Gary did a really good job of training me. So it was out of this association that you decided you wanted to become a pilot? Well, the pilots, uh, the, not only the ones that are driving the airplanes, but they're the ones that get the motion positions and stuff. Okay, and okay. I wasn't exactly uh, Casper Milk Toast about this whole business, you know. Okay. I was serious about about doing good and about being good. And, uh, and so uh, I volunteered to go to pilot training. Okay. And uh, I got accepted. And uh, there were several other people after me that volunteered out of the same unit to go uh, that I was in. And um, yeah, we, uh, so we went to pilot training. I started pilot training and I already had over 2,000 hours in the air. Okay. And uh, I'd seen, the, actually I'd seen the sun rise in the west. Okay. <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of strange, but yeah. it's really yeah. true. Yeah, it is. Uh, we don't have the time now, but no. I can explain to so, you how it happened. So let's see, um, let me go back. What? Uh, when did you go through pilot training? I went through pilot training in, uh, I started in April of 66. Okay. And I graduated in May of 67. Okay. And out of 70 people who graduated in my class, I was number two. Okay. And, and uh, so what was your first assignment? I chose to go to a C-141. Okay. As opposed to going to a fighter. Okay. My instructor would hardly talk to me because I did that. I'm, I understand that. But. There was a reason to that. I had a wife and three children, and there's a difference in the lifestyle of a <laughs> is. pilot and a pilot who's flying a multi-engine. There is, and, and we're not gonna go into that today either, so. <laughs> but there, there is a difference in there, and I had family responsibilities, and, I get and, that. and my family was really important to me. Now, how do you go from the 141 to an 01 bird dog. Oh, well, they were just looking for somebody to fill seats. Okay. So after I had a year in the 141, they just sent me a note and said, hey, by the way, why don't you go over here and why don't you show up on this date? And, and uh, so I went through uh, fact training okay. in an 02. Where'd you do that, at Hurlbut? I did that in Hurlbut in, okay. in Florida. Yeah. And uh, that was a really good course. It was a three week course crammed into six weeks. Right, yeah. And there was a reason for that. Yeah. Because a lot of folks didn't come back. So you didn't and you didn't go fly fighters first before you did that because I know a lot of people had to do that later in the war. They had to be they had to they had to go and fly fighters for a while before they could come back and be a forward air control. Well, there was a rule that for American troops, you had to be a ex fighter pilot to be a FAC. Right. Okay. For Vietnamese troops, that wasn't the case. Okay. So that and that's so, a big that's a big difference there, and I'd never heard that before. So that's well, that explains a lot. Well, it does. Yeah. Okay, and you mm -hmm. find out that being a previous fighter pilot was really not necessary. Well, because it doesn't take very long to figure out what's going on. I'm a Marine, and that was not a Marine Corps requirement. <laughs> that was that was an Air Force requirement. So I, I flew fighters after I flew OV tents, not before. So. Uh, We've gone really long on this one, Ed, and we could talk about this some more. Maybe we'll do this when we're up at uh, at Oshkosh together, That's talk fine. about this some more. But uh, uh, I really appreciate your time today. And Gary, uh, thank you for sending these items to us when you did. This is great timing to, to have these here while we're talking to Ed. <clears throat> this is all going to go on, on display here, and it really starts to fill yeah. in the story Gary, on the bird dog. Gary Willis ju has just done a terrific job. He really has. With uh, two books that he's written about yeah. the red markers and, and the uh, stuff where he, he has just done a wonderful job. I well, appreciate that guy. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll recommend to everybody that uh, you, you look up Gary Willis in his books and just so people.
people are aware, our bird dog has, is telling two stories. One side of the airplane is telling the red marker story, and the other side of the airplane is telling the, uh, the story of, uh, of Hilliard Wilbanks and uh, him being awarded the Medal of Honor for actions that that he did in the uh, in the bird dog, we're not going to talk about that today. We'll we'll leave that for another story. But our bird dog is going to be telling both of those stories, and uh, we're really looking forward to. Uh, this will be the only flying airplane in our uh, in our collection, and we're really looking forward to getting it out and getting the stories around. And uh, we're going to get you back in the bird dog again. So <laughs> that would be great. So, I look forward to that. So with that, uh, Ed, I'd like to thank you for being here today, and. Uh, Folks for, for joining in here and, and watching this. And we're gonna be putting this up on the YouTube channel. And uh, Ed, we'll see you in Oshkosh. All right, sounds great, thank okay. you. So this is uh, Jim Hodson from the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas. Uh, thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time.